Okay. So um, welcome everybody. This is, uh, my name is Terry Swartz Russell. I am the uh, co-chair of adult education at Temple Amuna in Lexington. And uh, this year our committee decided to form a anti-Semitism initiative team um, that decided that uh, since September, we've been offering programs and inviting guest speakers to explore all different aspects of anti-Semitism in the effort to educate our community about Jew hatred and what anti-Semitism is from many different perspectives and different kinds of media. Um, tonight, we're going to hear from two speakers from ADL. Um, but before we get there, uh, I want to give everybody some instructions. Uh, during the presentation, please mute yourself, um, just so that we don't have background noise. And also, uh, if you don't want to be seen, then don't turn on your video. Um, after, we will be taking questions and answers, and you can write your questions in the chat. Um, and uh, Ken Bruss, I want to thank, is a member of our anti-Semitism initiative team who uh, started speaking with our ADL representatives, in particular Peggy, who's one of our speakers tonight, and he will introduce everybody in a minute. But before that, um, next week, uh, all of a sudden, we were going to do one program a month. Now we're doing more, um, which is fine, uh, because this issue is it seems to be growing daily. Um, uh, so next week we're doing a, uh, a book discussion of Dara Horn's um, book, People Love Dead Jews, and it's going to be moderated by uh, Judy Cantor and by um, Fran Jacobs, who are also members of our team. So I'm going to find Judy and I'm going to spotlight her and I'm going to have her just give us a little spiel about next uh, February 17th. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. So on February 17th at eight o'clock, we are looking forward to a discussion of Dara Horn's new book, People Love Dead Jews. She was just awarded the Jewish Book Council Award for this book. Um, it, it's been getting a lot of attention. She presents details of the anti-Semitism that has colored our history for so long in a very unusual provocative light. So in response to this wave of anti-Semitism that um, we face, she's compiled 12 essays. And we've asked uh, those of you who would like to participate to read just six of them. We'd like you to come to the discussion whether you've read the book or not. Um, she challenges us to, to confront the reasons why there's so much fascination with Jewish death and so little respect for the lives that Jews are living. That's a, a main premise of her book. So there's much to talk about. We hope you'll join us and feel free to reach out um, to Fran or to me with uh, any questions beforehand. Hope you'll join us. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, hold on. And Ken, now we're going to go to Ken Bruss and he's going to introduce our speakers. Go ahead, Ken. Thanks, Terry. Uh, I feel really privileged to be introducing our speakers today. We have two very accomplished <clears throat> professionals from the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce both of them and then we'll begin. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Robert Treston, who's regional director of ADL's New England office with responsibility for overseeing the league's program delivery, community relations and advocacy initiatives across the region. Uh, as a civil rights leader and attorney for more than 25 years, he's prioritized developing community partnerships and initiatives that advocate for justice, equity and fair treatment for everyone. He also serves as vice president of ADL's Western Division. Before taking over the Boston office, he served as ADL's Northeast Civil Rights Council for eight years, where he led the league's cyber hate response team. Locally, he's led a statewide coalition that was responsible for drafting one of the most comprehensive anti-bullying laws in the country. Robert currently serves on the Massachusetts Hate Crimes Task Force 
advising Governor Baker on ways to combat, combat hate crimes in the Commonwealth. Robert holds a BA from Trent University and a JD from the University of Miami School of Law, a native of, a native of Montreal. David and his family lived in Dover, Massachusetts. Following Robert is going to be Peggy Shakur, who serves as a deputy regional director of ADL New England, where she's engaged in all aspects of ADI's mission. Peggy joined ADL in October 2019, following a career as a corporate lawyer, including serving as general counsel of a software of a global software and services company. She's involved with ADL New England's advocacy programs, training, strategic planning, law enforcement partnerships, outreach and engagement efforts in our collective fight against hate and anti-Semitism. She's been an active participant in pro bono, social justice and community activities. In the summer, she can be found on her bicycle training for and participating in the Pan Mass Challenge, probably with maybe a couple of the people on this call today. Uh, Peggy and her family live in Lexington. And now it's my, uh, uh, I'll just repeat, if you haven't already muted your phone, please do so. And now it's my privilege to turn over the floor to Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Actually, uh, Ken, Peggy and I are going to kind of do this. Peggy and I are like work partners. We, right. work, to, we work together uh, all day and every day. So we're going to actually do this together. Um, so we have like a, a slide deck that we're going to, Peggy is uh, getting on the on the Zoom channel momentarily. Yeah, just hang on just a sec. Yeah. I'll be right there. So um, while Peggy's um, just doing the tech, we're going to do a little bit of an overview of, of ADL and the work that we do, and um, then talk about some of the, the, the current issues. If, Peggy, I can share my screen if there's a if you're having a tech issue. No, nope, I think I think we're there. Can you can you see? Yeah, I can see. Okay, so uh, collective fight against anti-Semitism. And uh, it's really great to be here. I know it's like the end of the day, but the, honestly, like this is like the best time for Peggy and I to have a, uh, a good conversation about the work that we're engaged in every day because nobody's calling us um, and nobody's bugging us right now. Uh, ADL overview. So ADL founded in 1913. So we're like a 109 year old organization, which is... Uh, pretty significant of, you know, older than uh, I'm guessing every person, um, every person on the call right now. And our mission has been unchanged to stop the defamation of the Jewish people, secure justice and fair treatment for, uh, for everyone. So what's the work that we do? Um, we, well, next slide. One of the key components of our work is we do a lot of investigative work. Thanks to our center on extremism. We have a large center on extremism that is based in New York City and our center on technology and society, which is like, uh, you know, based in Silicon Valley. That's where we're working on all of the hate issues, anti-Semitism and other forms of hate that are happening on online. We have been monitoring and exposing hateful ideologies from groups uh, and individuals for decades. Like this is sort of some of ADL's core work. And we know like this is not like a new phenomenon. Like we'll talk about a lot of current things, uh, but hateful ideologies and extremists in the United States have been around a long time. We're also the largest non-governmental trainer of law enforcement. ADL is responsible for training up to, uh, about 15,000 uh, law enforcement professionals uh, across the United States every year. And uh, we're working with law enforcement on exposing and providing information on extremists all of the time. Pretty much, uh, uh, I, I heard of a colleague uh, just uh, this morning who identified uh, someone who was being um, beaten that they saw actually on Facebook Live by an extremist. And we were able to identify this person uh, and pass on the information to, to law enforcement. 
Another uh, important part of our work is around advocacy. And you just heard Ken mention that um, Peggy heads up all of our um, advocacy work. Can you change the slide, Peggy? Yep. Uh, so securing justice. So we are advocating for marginalized communities through work uh, in courts, through pushing uh, lobbying at the uh, legislators. You know, our, our office covers all of the New England states. And we have a large team of people in Washington, D.C. Uh, and we're, we're, we're constantly pushing. I'll give you like something that's not even yet public. It happened just earlier today. Uh, Peggy and my, our other colleague, Amy Feynman, who's another lawyer on our team, we've been working for months and months to have, it, we, we basically intervened in a uh, criminal case back in the 1980s. Uh, a man in the Berkshires was uh, tried and convicted of an, of an arson case, uh, always claimed that he was uh, innocent. And uh, just this morning, he, the conviction was tossed out. Why? The Berkshire County D actually acknowledged in the filing of the court papers that anti-Semitism played a prominent role in the jury's decision. Uh, I think Peggy and I would probably agree that it was part of the entire trial, but just a tangible result and just one of the un, unexpected places you might find anti-Semitism. Uh, and this is not like 100 years ago. This happened in the late night. It happened in, I think, in 1988. It was the late 1980s. And it took uh, decades to get it returned. Education um, is a large percentage of our work. And probably, you know, uh, our office in Boston, um, which Peggy and I run, is, is best known for ADL's education programs, really starting with my predecessor, uh, Lenny Zakem. Lenny Zakem in the 1980s really set the, you know, he did some ground work, groundbreaking work on designing um, education programs. And we now are working with students and educators and communities across New England to form a challenge, all forms of bias. We have a very unique anti-bias education model. And we're also doing a tremendous amount of work on um, anti-Semitism training. And we're actually now have a, a whole new program, a digital program uh, for uh, teaching about anti-Semitism in high schools. It's, it's, uh, it just started last year and it's already in four Massachusetts high schools, uh, maybe unsuspecting places, Springfield, Brockton and, um, and Boston. So um, for our agenda tonight, we're going to talk a bit about what anti-Semitism is, although um, I suspect this audience knows and has experienced it itself, how it relates to other forms of oppression, how you as an individual can respond when you see it, and how our community can confront it. Um, we're going to hopefully leave you with a, a number of tips and strategies of how you as a community might take some action um, to the anti-Semitism in the face of what we're seeing today and what we might see tomorrow. I think one thing we can all agree is that anti-Semitism is poorly understood. We have on the one hand, American Jews who say anti-Semitism is a problem. And on the other hand, Americans who don't even know what it means. More troubling or maybe equally troubling are the number of people, especially young adults, who are unaware of the 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust. These are, these are issues that are gonna come into play with what we'll talk about in a bit about the role that a community like yours can have in, in helping shed a light on anti-Semitism and um, education to raise awareness. So in terms of a definition, um, anti-Semitism is a form of prejudice directed against Jews as individuals and as a group. It's based on stereotypes and myths that target Jews as a people, their religious practices and beliefs, and the Jewish state of Israel. Sometimes it's talked about as Jew hatred. And we at ADL think about it and as parallel to all systems of oppression as something that manifests as exploitation, discrimination, and violence, as well as the dehumanization of the Jewish people based on stereotypes and oppression. 
we only have to look back less than two weeks to Colleyville to see that the person who uh, held the four individuals hostage did so on this misguided belief that Jews were in control and he wanted to talk to the head rabbi because that person had in his mind influence over the government and could make things happen because the government does things for Jews. Just one of the many, many examples we could all come up with. Um, I wanna take a moment here to just talk about the distinct things about anti-Semitism. We sometimes talk about anti-Semitism as, as punching up, that it includes a belief that Jews have extraordinary power. We've seen this in the context of, of uh, the pandemic where Jews were thought to control vaccine um, production and also on, on the other side of things where Jews were con considered dirty and um, perhaps responsible for spreading it. Now, if you wanna take a moment and just put in the chat what stereotypes or tropes you might see in these two cartoons or, or drawings. Um, you could see many of the typical historic stereotypes or tropes we often associate with anti-Semitism or racism. Is anyone gonna offer something in the chat or unmute yourself for a moment to, to provide an example? And you can see, see the control of the money, control of the banks with the bourse, um big noses the not not being good americans all kinds of things exactly exactly so we're going to move on now to um talk about some of the statistics behind anti-semitism robert you want to take this one Oh, yeah, sure. sure. So um, anti-Semitic incidents in the United States, you can see, uh, were, were uh, basically at historic uh, numbers. The last four years, we've, we've had the highest number of uh, anti-Semitic incidents um, on record. We're still in the process of, of compiling 2021, but uh, it's actually, you know, we, we, all the preliminary data tells us that it's uh, it's going to be consistent with what with what we've seen. So you can see here where where um, where do things happen, which I think is uh, you know in, in, in another important data point, and you can see that it's widespread across all sectors uh, of society. It occurs in both public places in schools, colleges, uh, houses of worship, uh, you know, obviously, um, and not, you know, not, you know, not always at the level that we saw in, um, in, in Colleyville, uh, and a lot in public spaces. And I would not under, we should not underestimate the impact of anti-Semitism in public spaces, because that is sort of the entry point for anti-Semitism to becoming normalized and part of the mainstream. So it's, uh, it's a, it, I, I, I think it's a real concern. Uh, state of anti-Semitism in, um, in, in, in you know, 2021, so where are we? Well, basically nearly, nearly two in three Jewish Americans tell us that they've experienced or witnessed an anti-Semitic incident in the, in the past year, in the past five years and that they feel their communities uh, are less safe than they were a decade ago. So that's a really, really important data point. I'm gonna throw one other one that's actually not on the slide. Last week, uh, Tufts University, uh, just on the campus environment, they, they just issued a, they acknowledged uh, you know, a lot of uh, research they, that they had done examining like the stat, the, uh, the state of Jewish life on campus. I'm just not remembering their exact wording. But one of the things that their data told them uh, was that half of the Jewish students on their campus had either experienced or, or observed some kind of anti-Semitism on the campus. So that's a little bit of a microcosm, but it's also consistent with what we're seeing across the country. 
40% of Jewish uh, Americans heard anti-Semitic comments, slurs, or, or threats directed at someone else over the, over the, um, over the last 12 months. And so, you know, well over 63% of Jews in America uh, are experiencing or witnessing uh, anti-Semitism. So, you know, for those who uh, want to downplay or not recognize that this is actually happening and a real problem, the data tells a completely, um, a completely different story. So to put a finer point on it before we jump into some of the specific incidents that we've been experiencing in New England, I want to just call your attention to the ADL tracker of anti-Semitic incidents, which is on our website. And this is a really useful tool because you can look at any state and get a, a summary of the anti-Semitic incidents that have happened that have been reported to ADL. So it's important both in terms of being able to see what is going on in the state, but also um, a good reminder of how important it is to report incidents when you see them or hear about them and encourage others to do so as well. You know, this tracker is, is a really useful tool for us in tracking what's going on, but also in advocating for for say additional security funding and in making sure that our lawmakers understand that anti-Semitism is a, a existing and pervasive problem that needs government attention. So that, that is one important tool that, that you have um, available to you. The audit for the next year will come out sometime in April, um, but right now you have everything up to date through 2020. Our heat map is a similar tool but it has a wider range of uh, incidents that might be reported. So you can really like zone in like right on a community, right in Lexington through this, and you can sort it by the types of activities, like, you know, uh, hopefully not, <laughs> you're not seeing a lot of extremist murders, but you can see the anti-Semitic incidents, the white extremist events, propaganda. Um, there are groups that come in and plaster a town with Patriot Front stickers that are, uh, meant to recruit uh, folks into these movements. Um, and you can really zero in on the activity that's happening. Again, dependent on, on getting reports into us, but it's a great uh, tool to be able to see what is going on in all parts of the country. And reporting is like absolutely critical. And I'll, I'll just make one other, um, one other point on this. You know, when you see the, the hate crime data, the FBI hate crime data, Jews are all, have, since they've been collecting data since 1990, been the religious group targeted the most. And when, the, when you see those numbers, the numbers are high, but they're really only like seven or 8,000 you know, uh, hate crimes committed in the United States that are actually reported. But the real data tells us that the number of hate crimes, not just against Jews, but, but, but other groups is really far in excess uh, of 150,000 um, hate crimes committed in the United States every year. And that's, that's, those are, that's not an ADL data point, that's the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is another division of the, the Department of Justice that, that, that tracks uh, all, all types of hate crimes. So reporting is absolutely critical. As Peggy said, we use it when we go and lobby, when we go and make policy arguments, when we go and ask for things, Data is absolutely critical, and we always um, encourage people to report as much as possible. So we're going to take a look at some of the New England incidents and what's sort of going on in our in our in our own community. Happy to sort of talk about Colleyville and other national um, national things. We'll, 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 we will definitely talk about that. And I'll just put a reminder out there that we're going to have time for Q and A and discussion. You may want to, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat now, or we can um, we can engage when we're done with uh, showing some of the slides. But some of the things that we're actually seeing here, a lot of Holocaust analogies by elected officials, uh, extremist fueled uh, hate crimes, high school sports, like uh, anyone who's read the Globe or the Herald in the la or a local paper in the last 12 months, you've seen this. Um, and the normalization of anti-Semitic tropes in everyday conversations. I mean, that's the, you know, the, the, the public presence of anti-Semitism, I think, feeds into that. Uh, and anti-Semitism is part of white extremism. 
So a couple of like just visuals to give you um, a sense, and, and you may uh, you may be familiar with some of these, maybe maybe not. Um, but you know, here you've got um, the school committee member. I can't I can't remember actually exactly where she's where, where was she from, Peggy? Um, Liz, Katie's from Vermont. Uh, Vermont. And... The other one is down in uh, it's like right on the border Dighton, of Rhode Dighton, Island, Dighton, Rehoboth. Yeah. But we've seen a lot of this in school uh, school committee people uh, drawing all sorts of comparisons and analogies to the Holocaust, completely inappropriate. Uh, and we've seen it in like written form on social media, but also in public meetings. And we are calling it out. It is th these are not appropriate um, analogies. Senator Rausch and I wrote a um, an op ed that the WGBH published in November that actually laid out the reasons why. We're not just, we didn't just wanna keep telling people to stop doing it. We actually wrote an op-ed that provided the reasons why this is wrong. But this is, this, this, um, this fuels, I just wanna, I just want everyone to recognize, this fuels anti-Semitism. The extremists that wanna target and do violence to Jews feed off of these kind of Holocaust analogies being made by public officials. It fuels them. It also fuels Holocaust deniers. So there are a lot of reasons why this has a, a, a very uh, potentially dangerous impact on our community. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight this hate crime in Winthrop, Massachusetts, just uh, you know, on the, well, it's actually part of Suffolk County, Boston, but just you know, closer, closer to the airport than the downtown core. Uh, a man killed two African-Americans. Um, uh, and it was it was concluded that it was a racially motivated uh, killing. He was he was killed uh, by Winthrop police about a block and a half away from the synagogue. This this did not get a lot of attention in in our kind of local Jewish community, but he did have a manifesto. It was laced with racism, anti-Semitism. And he was also on his phone hours before on anti-Semitic websites. And there's a real, he was killed by police, but there's a working theory that his real destination was the synagogue. So, uh, I mean, I mean, thank goodness um, he, didn't, he didn't make it. And then of course, uh, the stabbing of uh, Rabbi Naginsky in Brighton, this occurred in, in, in broad daylight. And again, here, uh, Rachel Rollins, who was the Suffolk County DA at the time, uh, charged him with uh, civil rights and hate crimes. He is uh, an Egyptian national. He's still in custody. I don't think he's ever going to get out of jail in this country because there's a detainer for him to be deported when his case is over, whether it's like over here or over in uh, after a state prison sentence. But this is this is a scary thing. Um, and I, I, I'm really pleased that the appropriate charges uh, were laid against him. But these are, these are two big incidents right in our own backyard um, of the threat to, to Jews in the Jewish community. Uh, the example here of um, the high school sports, uh, Duxbury, this was a major, major situation that kind of broke uh, last last spring. And what we learned was that it wasn't really an, a one-time incident. The football team, and you can see a picture here of the coach. This is a, a high school Super Bowl winning team. This is a championship team with a championship coach. And for years, uh, they were using Jewish terms like a rabbi, a dreidel. Uh, I'm uh, trying to think of some of the others. Uh, as as football plays, and they also uh, it came out that they were also using Auschwitz as a football play, and we called for uh, a a major investigation. They the the school district did hire an outside uh, investigators, and it turned out that this wasn't something that had been going on for a short period of time. It had been going on for years and years and years. He's no longer the coach. Uh, we're working with them on education programs, but there was a real question of why did it take so long for somebody to say something? 
And for those of you who don't know, the story broke during a football game because one of the opposing players heard the, the play calls that they were and, and told his coach. And that coach called the Duxbury, um, I don't know if it was the principal or the superintendent. Uh, so, you know, it, it took someone uh, who heard something and said, this is wrong. Their, their moral compass uh, went off immediately. And that's how this, this, uh, this story broke. <clears throat> In Danvers, uh, it, was, it was the hockey team. And this was another situation where there had been complaints, uh, in fact, to ADL for quite some time about inappropriate things that were happening within the, uh, the locker room and the chats, excuse me, of the Danvers hockey team. The chat, which Peggy and I have actually seen, contained uh, racism, homophobia, um, and a lot of anti-Semitism. I, I have to tell you, it was quite disgusting and despicable. And this too, we learned had been institutional and going on for quite, quite some time. And it was really the Boston Globe that, uh, that broke this story. It was Bob Haller, who's a sports reporter, and he had been working on this, um, talking to us for, I think, a year to 18 months. And there is some significant change underway in, in Danvers High School. But let's not forget that, you know, you know, think back to the definition of anti-Semitism that, that Peggy shared and the stereotypes and the sort of moving it into the mainstream. Uh, these, two, these two high schools uh, really had a, uh, it, it was all over. And, and I think uh, and, uh, endemic within their structures. We're also now working with Danvers uh, for them to get over this. Yeah, and I might add that in contrast to Duxbury, the Danvers investigation, uh, when it was completed, was pretty much hidden and um, where it was fairly transparent in terms of the actual recommendations in Duxbury and the administration started acting on them right away. In Danvers, really not so much, which only intensified the lack of trust um, within the town, among school officials, among law enforcement, and has made the situation there um, even more intractable than, than what we've seen in Duxbury, which really sort of embraced the recommendations and, and made a, a, has been making a real effort to turn things around. I'm gonna talk about a few more incidents. Um, I don't know why this uh, just, changed here, but um, I will describe to you what that ad was. But first on the left um, is an Instagram uh, photo from a Worcester firefighter on his personal uh, Instagram page. But even so, we talked about Holocaust analogies a bit earlier and using that um, to make a point again about uh, vaccines and, um, you know, his, his lack of uh, support for our current president when, when being made by a member of law enforcement, in this case, a firefighter, doesn't really engender trust by the community in the people who, who are being paid to serve them. And uh, we raised this um, with town officials and um, it resulted in some investigation of this particular person, but more importantly, um, a very uh, clear statement by the town, by the town manager, which you can see here, but ongoing conversations now with town leadership, the mayor's office, the fire chief, the chief of police, the DA, city council members, and representatives of the Jewish community to start talking about anti-Semitism as, as part of what needs to be, there needs to be sort of a baseline knowledge among public officials and lines that really shouldn't be crossed. Um, so, th so that happened just last month. The McGovern Auto ad, which I, I thought I had a, a photo of that, but it seems to have disappeared, but I'm gonna describe it to you because it was, um, it was so startling when we saw it. It's an ad that involves a dog who is trying to buy a car from someone at McGovern Auto. 
And at one point, the dog who doesn't talk with words, but talks with, you know, a little, little animated bubble says something about, I'm going to chew him down, C-H-E-W. But that's, you know, like, you know, not lost on, on any of us here. And um, got a lot of complaints about that and have been um, trying to reach out to McGovern Auto. This ad is no longer available, but it's a, again, an, an example of how these, these incidents of anti-Semitism, these, you know, what people feel are harmless plays on words seep into either everyday conversation or advertisements and, and unless they're called out can be normalized. And I want to call out one more uh, incident that actually um, happened uh, in Adams, Massachusetts. And um, I, I want to call this out because on its surface, it's, um, it's pretty shocking. What you see is um, what they call intentions for services in the Catholic Church. So it's sort of a theme, but it's connected to a liturgy. And the uh, intention for December 25th was for the conversion of the Jewish people that they received Jesus as their Messiah. So this wasn't a church bulletin. It was reported to us. We were able to gather the, the community um, and um, there were many communications with the bishop who um, interceded. Um, at first, the intention was changed to conversion of non-Christians and ultimately um, the entire intention of, of that mass was changed and um, the priest who was new to that um, parish was also removed from his duties. Um, but it was, while sort of shocking to see those words in black and white like that, also um, an example of how a community could come together and um, work with, with the bishop in this case to address um, a situation that was really um, very disturbing. And then, you know, because, because we've been talking about all these incidents that that are troubling and concerning. Um, you know, out of some of this, we also do advocate. And, and this was a real highlight of our year, which was the signing of the genocide education bill this year, which was a top legislative priority for us in Massachusetts. Um, we'd worked on, on legislation in New Hampshire, which passed very readily, but there was a bit more opposition in Massachusetts and, and you know, frankly, the situations in Danvers and Duxbury helped underscore the importance of this education. Um, so I uh, just want to take a moment to actually celebrate um, one of these achievements that I think will, will help us going forward in this state. So now we're going to turn to what you can do. So oh, are you doing this, Peggy? Um, Go ahead. I, I, I can, sure. So um, yeah, the ADL framework kind of kind of puts things in three buckets and they work they work pretty well from, from our perspective. Um, speak up. Um, you've seen examples of how we've spoken up as an organization, but it's it's not something that we, you know, we can't be the only voice and, and your voices matter. So when you see something, you can say something, you can report the incidents to ADL, you can let your local leaders know that something's unacceptable. Um, you can, you know, call, write, email, you can show strength, which um, involves educating yourselves as you're doing tonight, finding ways to have these conversations, um, finding ways to uh, help others understand what anti-Semitism is and why they should be concerned, and to speak up when, when you see something wrong. And then sharing facts. And uh, we spent some time tonight focusing on some data. And, um, you know, data, you know, data and facts are knowledge um, that are, it, it, knowledge that's important to share. Um, that's the type of knowledge that can be data for legislative change. And it's also knowledge and and information that can shut down rumors, tropes, and lies. So in terms of taking action, 
Um, I want to highlight some of the things that a community like yours with a very well informed and active um, and knowledgeable group of people who are committed to fighting anti Semitism can take. Um, one resource that we have put together is a toolkit called anti Semitism Uncovered. I will, I will provide all the links to these materials after this so that you'll have them, but it gives you sort of a roadmap of how to, how to do things just in, in what I was talking about, speaking up, sharing facts and showing strength with respect to a number of common incidents and situations um, in terms of reporting, in terms of having conversations about Israel, and in terms of understanding anti-Semitism. In terms of um, just what you can do, you can form an inclusive committee, um, which you've already done within your congregation. You can find ways to educate both inside the, the congregation and in the larger community. You know, some ideas are things like watch parties, teach-ins, group reads, like it sounds like you're doing as well, using the toolkit. You can advocate, you know, conversations with elected officials to hear your story, for you to be able to tell your story about why you are so concerned with anti-Semitism and why it matters to you, those are really compelling. So invite your local elected officials in or invite a candidate in and, and ask them questions, ask them the really hard questions and get those answers. Um, involving the broader community, the reason why um, we talked about that church in Adams is because the broader community was really essential in, in sending a message that that lack of inclusiveness um, to put it lightly, really wasn't going to be acceptable. So involving school leadership, interfaith, um, civic leaders um, in this learning experience is an important action step that you can take. Um, you can invite people, invite parents to a discussion about, to talk about anti-Semitism. It can have, be in terms of playground issues to campus issues for high school students about to go off to college. Um, that that is a uh, couple hour conversation in and of itself. And think about programs um, to build bridges, you know, through a Jewish holiday, um, whether it's um, Yom HaShoah or whether it's maybe even a happier Jewish holiday to share the joy of, of Judaism, not just um, the, the trauma of anti-Semitism. And it's important to be able to be um, comfortable uh, and have a level of confidence when you're talking about Israel. So understanding how to discuss anti-Israel rhetoric, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. One of the things that we see uh, all the time is the sort of mainstreaming of anti-Zionism on college campuses or you know, in the halls of Congress. I, I, I would add probably like you know, state houses across New England and the country as well. And in you know various various progressive um, places, the you know we have an example today, which is the release of Amnesty uh, International's report, which is uh, you know barely barely it doesn't even ex it recognize Israel's uh, you know Israel Israel's right right to exist. So you know building a toolkit and being engaged and being proactive is absolutely critical. This is one of the things that we've uh, prioritized by, and, and we can certainly circulate. We did a whole series of uh, short videos, 30 minutes on like, how do you get five tips, five little uh, uh, nuggets to be able to have these co uh, conversations with people. Uh, holding elected officials uh, accountable is, uh, is is part of our it's part of our strategy as an organization, but uh, it's I would argue it's also a part of each one of our responsibilities, both uh, within the Jewish community, but you know as voters, as citizens, as people who live in the community, showing up, using the system, uh, and asking hard questions. Uh, just today, we um, we took on the city of Malden because Malden uh, voted the other day uh, to hold a town meeting on uh, on Kol Nidre. And they actually had a, a, a discussion about this and voted in favor of doing it, which 
we believe disenfranchises uh, Jews in the city of Malden. And even their uh, alternative of like, well, you can watch it on YouTube. It, it takes away the ability of Jewish citizens and voters in the town of Malden to interact and participate in the public process of government in a way uh, that, other, that others are gonna be allowed to. Because there's not a lot of holidays, quote unquote holidays, where people are prohibited from doing anything. Kol Nidre is one of them for our community. So we're, we're uh, somebody alerted this to us and we're gonna now, um, we're taking it on already. And, and Peggy gets uh, full credit for actually uh, doing the articulation and getting this thing out today. I want to turn down to um, a newly released guide that ADL did in conjunction with the uh, conservative movement. And it is a toolkit to help synagogues uh, prepare for confronting anti-Semitism. So I will, of course, give you the links to this as well. It's downloadable from the website, um, but it gives you guidance on prevention and preparation for building community relations with neighbors, law enforcement, administrators, how you go about uh, developing your security plans and procedures, a variety of checklists um, for what to do on the day of or week of an incident, um, some sermon suggestions, um, and then ideas for community healing after an incident occurs. I think one thing I've learned through my work with ADL is that once an incident is over, it doesn't mean that, that everything's okay, that we need to create some space for that healing to take place. So um, this is a, a terrific new tool, just uh, I think like a week old, that um, I think will be a real, uh, of really a value to the community. Um, similarly, we've talked a lot about incident response. Um, you can also now re uh, put incidents directly in a USCJ incident response form um, instead of going directly to the ADL. Um, reporting mechanism and they'll be sort of consolidated and reported together. So, you know, we, we are partnering uh, to really enhance our ability to collect incidents um, and, and really make sure that our data is as strong um, in underscoring the extent of anti-Semitism as it can be. One other tool I really wanna call out here is um, another guidebook. and and. This is really geared to um, educators. And um, you know, you don't have to go beyond the globe right now. That's reporting, I think, 20 swastikas at Curry College. But every day it seems we're getting reports of a swastika being found in one of our schools, be it an elementary school, a middle school, a high school. Um, it's it's all over and it's happening all the time. Um, and it's not always swastikas, sometimes it's the N-word, sometimes um, it's anti-immigrant bias. And uh, we put together a guide to help administrators um, deal with this, how they would communicate quickly to their school communities, what they can do to educate and heal, and then a number of reflection moments to turn incidents into teachable moments. There are people who don't really know why a swastika or a Heil Hitler salute is so harmful to particularly Jewish students, but also many other students. So this guide gives a number of, of lessons and, and reflections um, that educators themselves can use in the aftermath of an incident to turn them, as I said, into teachable moments. And, and one other tool that we talked about earlier is uh, a program we call Bina, which is um, a digital course um, really about um, modern Jewish life and Jews and the impact of anti-Semitism. It's online, it's free, and it's geared really not to educating Jewish students in religious school, but educating public school students or you know, students in, uh, in school about the Jewish experience um, on, the, on the view that, you know, again, there are people who just have never met Jews or have a lot of misconceptions about what the Jewish people 
who, who the Jewish people are or what Jews do, and that just fuels anti-Semitism. This is an effort to um, counter that through this course. And again, um, this is yet another way by promoting the deployment of this course, and Robert mentioned earlier, it's in a number of towns in Massachusetts that you know, knowledge can be shared and, and we can educate um, students um, about what the Jewish experience has been in this country. And uh, finally, um, No Place for Hate, which is our anti-bias program in schools. And again, it's a, another way for you to advocate for schools in your communities to become No Place for Hate schools, to undertake three activities that fight uh, hate and bias and get that designation. Again, just fostering a culture where hate is not tolerated. And a couple, a couple of other, uh, you know, final points about things that you you can do: learning to recognize hate symbols and obviously reporting them. Being an ally, being an ally is critical in not just fighting anti-Semitism, but in all all forms, uh, all forms of hate. Building uh, relationships. I think you know one of the lessons of Colleyville were that there were so many relationships that had already been built and were established. And those uh, those relationships proved to be uh, absolutely critical in the, in um, in the moment of the attack, and uh, taking action. That means being a uh, participant in the process, not just the process of democracy, but the process of combating all forms of uh, of anti-Semitism. We should not never underestimate like the most the, the most powerful tool each person has, and that's your voice. And you can exercise that like verbally, or you can exercise that, you know, online by writing something or actually, you know, sending a, a, a handwritten note. But that is, uh, that's of critical importance. And we all have it. It's not a tool that none of us don't have. So I'm going to stop sharing now and um, be nice to see some faces. Um, and, uh, We'll check out, are there some questions in the chat? So yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, let's sort of go backwards since we're right here. Um, so the curriculum, I think that question uh, yeah. from Joelle is, pro uh, I, I'm guessing you're talking about Bina, which is the high school curriculum. Uh, it's a, I think, four-part, correct me if I'm wrong, Peggy, four-part digital uh, program. It focuses on um, Jew uh, Jewish. It's, it's, uh, it's about anti-Semitism and, um, you know, what it is to be Jewish. So it does, it touches on like different aspects of Judaism, including uh, diversity within the, within the Jewish community. We worked with EverFi. EverFi is the largest provider of digital curriculum in the United States. So like you know, we're probably almost familiar with like you go to you go, you go to school and you have a textbook, right? There are textbook writers. You know, now there are like you know digital providers, and uh, so we worked on the content. Everfi actually produced it. It's it, we have a goal of getting it into a thousand high schools in 2022. It was piloted in uh, 20 late 2020 and 2021. It's in Marin County. Uh, outside of the Bay Area now in all of their schools. And the initial feedback, because there is um, a data and monitoring um, about the effectiveness of it, so far it's, it's been incredibly um, positive. The data points that are coming back, and again, as Peggy mentioned, not intended for Jewish students. To, you know, When I think about the high schools that it's in in Massachusetts, two in uh, Pittsfield, one in Brockton and, um, and one school in Boston. I'm not sure which BPS school it is. Th these are not schools that have high Jewish, high populations of Jewish students. It, it, it's interesting though, because um, many of the Jewish students could use the same education, you know, who are in public schools or day schools. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, we, we have programming for, you know, Jewish, um, Jewish audiences. Which is uh, which is a little bit different. Um, Joelle also asks: is, Does anybody, maybe Peggy, knows the climate in the local high schools? Um, yeah, I, I'm a few years out of date for the local high schools here in Lexington, um, 
but I, I suspect, um, I, Ben, can I put you on the spot? Because I, I see you and you and I spoke just yesterday, I think. That's correct. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm a sitting member of the Acton Boxborough um, School Committee. And I don't want to give too much information because I, I'm not sure if the parent reached out uh, as of yet. But um, in my tenure as school committee member, I've heard rumblings of anti-Semitism. And most recently, I just re I received an email confirming um, potentially an incident that took place at the high school level, in, um, including a junior high school student and a high school student. So it's out there, unfortunately, and you know we're trying to deal with it on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. And we're very thankful for partners like the ABL um, and Peggy and Robert in terms of assisting us and, and uh, Superintendent White on issues such as anti-Semitism, bigotry and xenophobia in, in our community. So um, Sharon Kalis early on in the discussion asked if anti-Zionism activity is included in your incidents and I, I, when you had your um, charts up. And do public places include uh, what is happening in Congress and, and the Senate when you? Well, that's a good question. I, you know, ev every incident is evaluated independently. So it, you know, we, we, we have a huge, we, we have intake that comes in and, you know, our office may take in probably four or 500 just in Boston alone incidents in the course of the year. And we analyze and assess every single one. Not every single thing that happens is a quote unquote anti-Semitic incident. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that it's, uh, the, you know, not bias. It doesn't mean that someone, there wasn't a victim or someone wasn't offended, but we look to see like, was this motivated by anti-Semitism? Is there anti-Semitism embedded in it? So, um, you know, I'm, I, I imagine that there are some that are public officials that, 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 end, that end up on the audit, but I, I can't speak to every single one. And, and, and I do think it's, a, it's important to have a case-by-case -case analysis and we dedicate a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time to doing that. Okay, and uh, Fred wants to know from Peggy, what are the legal penalties for anti-Semitic crimes, if any? Hey, Fred, nice to see you. Um, so an anti-Semitic crime, if it meets the legal definition of a hate crime, um, might have an enhanced penalty. But many of the incidents we've talked about, while they're, they're hateful and they're harmful, they might not meet, they might not be a crime, and they might not meet the, the higher standard for a hate crime in that someone had some intent to, um, to commit a crime against someone just based on their um, their characteristics, be it race or religion. So you could look at the rabbi in Brighton and you know, there's a question at the beginning, was he just randomly selected or did somebody like really intend to go and, um, and stab a rabbi because of anti-Jewish sentiment? Um, so, so there are a lot of sort of legal pieces there, but you know, there was definitely a crime committed. So there would be a legal penalty for that. The question I think that you might be asking is when does it become a hate crime? And, and that's a question of, of having to look at someone's intent about you know, really selecting and targeting someone because of a particular characteristic. Okay, um, thank you. Mark and Naomi asked, it seems that progressive organizations and diversity initiatives sensitive as they are to racism, homophobia, et cetera, ignore anti-Semitism or perhaps foster it by lumping Jews in with other white people. Is ADL doing anything to address that? So that's a, that's a big issue um, that we are spending a lot of time on. I'll tell you, it, it comes up a lot in the sort of DEI context and DEI space. And Can you define what that means? Because I had asked diversity, my e diversity, equity, inclusion. So a lot of uh, you know companies in the corporate space, in the corporate world, schools, both uh, you know in the public school side and also independent schools, college campuses, and we you know as we you know it typically happens something you know there's an incident somewhere and we start digging in. 
And uh, it turns out that like, you know, they're, they're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, but like anti-Semitism is not a part of it. Um, and we're, we're really pushing pretty hard. We're pushing back on that. Th th this, I would, th you know, this is a, uh, it's a community-wide uh, challenge. Uh, ADL is not the only organization that that's moving this forward. And, you know, I think we have, uh, we've seen many examples of, uh, you know, where anti-Semitism kind of gets downplayed or not recognized. I mean, I saw a communication from a uh, Boston area independent school post Colleyville. I'm not going to name the school, um, even though there was an email that they sent out uh, that basically uh, blamed the Colleyville on uh, mental health and international affairs and maybe a little bit of anti-Semitism. So, you know, I can see some people reacting to that, but like we got, we got calls and we met with the head of the school, you know, so a school that has a DEI webpage, do they have anti-Semitism listed on that webpage? Like those are important questions. And if you're in those spaces, those are the things that you, you know, when we talk about what you can do, like if you, if you have a, you know, grandchild, child uh, that's in one of these spaces, those are important questions. And Peggy and I are asking them all the time. Thank you. Um, so Ken wants to know, do you have any information on the proposed legislation to provide funding to synagogues for security? Uh, I don't have any specific uh, information. Maybe Peggy does. We um, support we support this. A lot of the applications, if the synagogue is applying for one, use a lot of our data points. So we often provide uh, data on anti-Semitic incidents that can be used to support applications. CJP has a lot of support around this. Right. Uh, so Jeremy Yeaman, uh, Dan Levinson, uh, Jeremy's the security director, Dan is his deputy. They're really, really good. And CJP um, is really uh, invested in Jewish communal security and they are providing a lot of support. So anyone, you know, whether it's the synagogue, a day school, any Jewish institution that is looking for this kind of uh, grant, they can really help get, get it across the finish line. We should be grateful, you know, Governor Baker uh, and, you know, my colleague at the JCRC, Jeremy Burton was instrumental in this. They doubled the amount of money that Massachusetts is putting into this. I mean, it's not just for the Jewish community, it's for other communities. Think back to the slide where some of the, you know, where, where do things happen? A lot of things happen in, you know, places where people pray. So it's a good, it's a, uh, we are unfortunately in a place right now in a moment of time when government funding to provide this kind of security support is necessary and required. Yeah, Temple of Moon has been closed because of the recent uptick in COVID for the last almost month, and it's going to be reopening next week, in case anybody wants to know that, uh, for services in person, which is lovely, except, um, you know, we're doing all this work and we want, we have uh, online this year been inviting all kinds of organizations and people from all over and partnering with people to be part of these conversations. And yet, you know, the question is, who are we going to let into our building? And uh, we don't know the answer to that. But I and, just I would... and Terry, it, since I'm working with Adam and Mike, and within On a couple security, of weeks, there's yeah. going to be a community, A, there'll be a community conversation, but B, it's a real heated topic with the religious committee <laughs> with regard, <laughs> no, course, specifically about, well, it's, can you, security recommends you lock the doors. Can right. you lock the doors at time of minion? At the time of Minion, if it isn't a congregant, can you ask them who they are and why, or is that not considered welcoming? So just to yes, it's, a, it's a fine line. Um, so Sharon asked another question. In some lectures on anti-Semitism, people are starting to move toward the term Jew hatred, as it seems to be better understood. Any thoughts within ADL about this? 
think it's fine, Peggy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard I've heard both terms um, used, you know, within ADL, and um, I think whatever kind of gets people's attention um, and and hearing, you know, the same the same hatred used, you know, get more attention by calling it uh, using words that that might resonate in a different way. I, I think is actually a, a good thing. Yeah, I've heard that uh, Deborah Lipstadt, Rachel Fish, um, subs, you know, support that use of, of Jew hatred. Uh, next question is Harvey Bynes wants to know what is ADL doing to combat non-white anti-Semitism, such as the Nation of Islam, um, on their materials and sermons delivered by Muslim clergy, et cetera. We will call out anyone, anywhere, anytime who spews out anti-Semitism. Nation of Islam, uh, headed by uh, Minister Farrakhan, I mean, he's probably the, the most well-known, most public anti-Semitism in the United States. Uh, and they're, they're, they're out there spewing their stuff. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I think it also speaks to the importance of uh, building allies and allyship within different uh, communities. I think back to the pouring rain day in Brighton last July when we were standing out in the rain after Rabbi Ninginski was, was stabbed. And there were plenty of leaders of color who were there. Rachel Rollins was a phenomenal speaker. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'm, you know what, I'm blanking on his name. There but was there, a there, black there, minister who was amazing. Yeah. and. Oh my God, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting his name. Who ran for city council? Uh, who who was also there? Anyway, there, there, w w w we have a lot of support in different sectors. But if people are gonna if people are gonna spew out hatred, I don't care what it is. We're gonna call them out on it. And all of us need to be uh, doing that. Okay. Um, a couple of people have asked. Can you say more about resources for younger American Jewish Americans? who grew up sheltered from anti-Semitism and who may only recently be exposed to it? Well, we, we have a, a lot of resources. Um, some of what we will send to you are actually pretty digestible just through a video. Um, one in particular, you had mentioned Rachel Fish earlier. Uh, she and our education director um, put together one on interrupting anti-Semitism in everyday conversations that has a lot of, you know, just really great strategies to practice. That might be one, one way, but, you know, not everything is just sort of self-learning. Um, sometimes it's, it's good to be involved and for younger Jewish Americans, or really it's not even exclusively Jewish who might want to be involved in some of our programs like the Glass Leadership Institute, there are a number of opportunities like that at ADL if, if someone wants to make that, that level of uh, commitment of time and education. Okay, I just want to mention to everybody who's on the call, I think everybody should know by now that Rachel Fish is a member of Temple of Muna and she will be our Glasser Scholar in Residence um, uh, speaker uh, the weekend of April 1st through 3rd. And she, one of her sessions is devoted specifically to high school kids and their parents. Um, so should that we should spread the word and people should bring people to attend the weekend. Um, but we'd love to open that up and it's a scary thought. Last question is, um, where is it? Uh, okay, um, so people are always equating anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Anti um, so the question is, what is a, where does it, how do you draw the line separating criticism of Israel from anti-Semitism and are you dealing with that? Yeah, we're dealing with it every day. Um, look, criticism of Israel is like, okay, like we criticize the United States all the time, but denying Israel's right to exist, no. I mean, the, the, the Amnesty International report that just came out, like, no. You know, anti-Zionism and denying the Jewish people uh, the right to a homeland, like we're suddenly the only group that doesn't get a homeland, that's anti-Semitism. And we're going to, we're, we're, you know, so, so that, that's, I, I think, I think, I think we have to stand pretty firm on that. But you know what? Israel's a democracy and we criticize, you know, our own democracy and like other democracies all the time. 
uh, even when you, you know, uh, I'm sure many, many of us have spent time in Israel. Uh, Israelis don't agree on political things uh, every day either, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a right to have their own country and their own uh, and, 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 and have a Jewish homeland. Um, just um, one more question, because it was too good to pass up. Yeah. Um, do you think that if a high school students received a balanced education about Israel as compared with only learning about the good things, that they would be better prepared to handle college issues? We have we have heard that time and again, and it's not just an ADL position. Um, you know, I, I'd say that you talk to people at Hillel International and uh, even did a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago with uh, members of the conservative movement and Hillel. And that was a very common through line through what many people were discussing. If students get to college and they only have a utopian view of Israel, they're completely unprepared to engage in any kind of conversation or dialogue. And, uh, you know, they, they need to, you know, as, as Robert was just saying, you know, we criticize our government um, they need to have license to criticize the Israeli government um, and engage in those conversations. So um, I think that that's actually a really important part that needs to happen um, before students get to college. Yeah. Yeah. Increasingly, we've seen, uh, you know, college uh, Jewish, you know, the minute you quote unquote support Israel or demonstrate support for Israel on a campus, like you're excluded from everything else. You can become ostracized. It's a real, it's a real problem. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, Tufts has, has, has recognized, I mean, we all live here. So, you know, every uh, September to November, there's going to be some incident about Tufts University in the Boston Globe. Like I can almost, uh, Peggy and I can predict it like clockwork, but they've come a long way and President Monaco acknowledged it, but it is, I, I'm, I'm mentioning it because it's, it's tied into the question. Uh, when you think about, you know, how this stuff plays out in like an environment, whether it's a school, a workplace or a campus. Great. Well, thank you for uh, coming to our community and educating us. We really look forward to getting all the materials that Peggy, the links to the materials that Peggy mentioned and that you mentioned. Um, I'll give you both a few closing closing remarks if you have any, and then we can say good night. Well, I'll just say thank you for uh, taking you. the time to be engaged in in the discussion because when we when you think about combating anti-Semitism, you know, we have, we have to be engaged. We have to be having these conversations amongst ourselves and it takes time and commitment. So everybody put aside time and commitment tonight to do it, which, which we really appreciate. Peggy. Yeah. All I was going to say is, um, you know, there's, I, I hope we have left you with something that you feel like you can do um, because there, there really is many things we we each can do, and you don't you don't need to work for ADL to be able to do it. So um, yeah. thanks for educating yourselves to to kind of join in this because there's plenty of work for everyone. And thank you. It was a wonderful program, and you've really given us some next steps because uh, we've been educating all year, and we're trying to move towards advocacy. And if people want to be involved in that, please just send me an email or. Uh, let the office know at Temple of Muna. Um, so good night, everybody, and thank you for attending. And thank you very much, Robert and Peggy. Thank you. Pleasure.